title of this lecture is saline infusion sonography. After the introduction, I will describe the technique of saline infusion sonography, the indications, contraindications, and risks associated with the procedure, and I will run up with a take home message. The learning objective for this lecture is to know the application of saline infusion sonography in gynecology practice. All images used for this presentation were of cases managed in two hospitals in Borno State. Saline infusion sonography is the use of saline to distend the endometrial cavity for the assessment of the shape and regularity of the endometrial cavity. We know that for nidation to take place, the endometrial cavity should and must be in optimal condition. And therefore, if there is any lesion or disruption of the endometrial cavity, it will reduce the receptivity of the endometrial cavity for a successful implantation. Uterine abnormalities are associated with increases of miscarriage and preterm births. The sensitivity of saline infusion sonography is comparable to the gold standard, which is hysteroscopy. Saline infusion sonography can help to guide the method to use to obtain biopsy. If saline infusion sonography shows that the lesion is localized, then probably hysteroscopy is a better option to obtain the biopsy. But if saline infusion sonography shows that the lesion is diffuse, a blind biopsy would as well be done. More than 40% of women who present with abnormal bleeding have uterine anomalies ranging from polyps, fibroids, additions, and congenital uterine anomalies. The prevalence of uterine cavity anomalies in infertile women is between 11 and 45%. There are different modalities that are in use to evaluate the regularity and the shape of the uterine cavity. 2D ultrasound scan, 3D transvaginal ultrasound, saline infusion sonography, which we are looking at today, the time honored history stratigraphy, and the gold standard hysteroscopy. The sensitivity of 2D for detection of intracavity lesion is poor. Yes, hysteroscopy is the gold standard, but hysteroscopy does not assess the condition of the myometrium, neither does it assess the adnexa. So, infusion sonography is a safe procedure. It is not invasive. It's simple, easy to learn, acceptable, and is a cost-effective method for assessment of endometrial lesions. It also assesses the myometrium, assesses the adnexa, and can also be used to assess sliding sign, which is telescopy will not afford such an opportunity. These are some of the indications for saline infusion sonography. After my uterine breeding, both in pre- and postmenopausal women, uterine fibroids, polyps, intrauterine adhesions, congenital uterine malformations. When there is suspicion 
of endometrial pathology. And in women who are being evaluated for infertility, especially before in vitro fertilization, when the endometrium is thick in patients with recurrent pregnancy losses, and when the evaluation of the endometrium is unsatisfactory on transvaginal scan. The contraindications are absolute and relative. Of course, pregnancy and active genital infection are absolute contraindications. Relative contraindications are intertrine device and in patients who are suspected to have endometrial cancer. The Rex is a well tolerated procedure with infection rate of less than 1%. Now, looking at hysteroscopy vis-a-vis -vis saline infusion sonography. Hysteroscopy requires anesthesia. Even the office hysteroscopy will require some form of anesthesia or anesthesia. It is an invasive procedure. It is expensive, time-consuming, and there is lots of time off from school, work, and business, and complications like uterine perforation is associated with hysteroscopy. On the other hand, saline infusion sonography can be done without even a pain relief, no talk of anesthesia. It is less invasive. It's quick and easy to perform. It is cheaper than hysteroscopy, safer than hysteroscopy. It's more tolerated by patients, and patients are more satisfied with saline infusion sonography than hysteroscopy. The landing curve is shut. Here, you can assess the uterus, the adnexa, the porch of Douglas. You can assess for saline sign. And you can pick some non-gynecological conditions. When 3D is used for SIS, the sensitivity is even higher than 2D saline infusion sonography. Now, this meta-analysis uh, looks at comparison of diagnostic accuracy of saline infusion sonohysteriography, transvaginal sonography, and hysteroscopy in evaluating the endometrial polyps in women with abnormal uterine bleeding, a systematic review and meta-analysis. And the conclusion was that although that hystero, I beg your pardon, although that sonohysteriography is a safe and relatively cheap method, which allows really out or confirming endometrial polyps, it cannot be replaced with hysteroscopy due to the fact that hysteroscopy combined with biopsy is the gold standard for ruling out malignancies in an endometrial polyp. <laughs> this was a first systematic review that looked at the diagnostic accuracy of saline infusion sonography titled Diagnostic Accuracy of Saline Infusion Sonography in the Evaluation of Uterine Cavity Abnormalities Prior to Assisted Related Techniques. This was a systematic review and meta-analysis, which concluded that SIS is a highly in sensitive investigative modality and comparable to the gold standard tool, hysteroscopy, in the rejection of intratrine abnormalities in subfertile women. SIS is a highly sensitive and specific test in the diagnosis of uterine polyps, some mucous myomas, uterine anomalies, and intratrine adhesions, and can be used as a screening tool for subfertile patients prior to in vitro fertilization treatment. And this figure is a summary receiver operator curve of SIS in the detection of all intrauterine anomalies, and you can see the area under the curve. So let's look at the technique. First, you do a conventional transvaginal ultrasound scan, and preferably within the first 10 days, just like we do for hysterosepiography. Few days after completion of menses and before the tenth day, preferably between day six and ten of the cycle. In postmenopausal women or women on long active birth and contraception, this can be done at any time. 
Antibiotics may be given, but I do not give antibiotics for saline infusion, sonography. But for saline infusion, sonohysterography, I do. In the same way, I do not give any analgesics for saline infusion, sonography, but I do. For saline infusion, sonohystero, salpingo, graphic. This is an aseptic procedure. The vulva is clean. A binary manner examination is done to determine the position, the size, whether there are masses or whether there are contraindications to the procedure. A bivalve speculum is inserted, and either the anterior or posterior of the cervix is held, depending on the position of the uterus on the initial bimanual examiner. The catheter is flushed with water for injection or normal saline to ensure that there are no air bubbles. Now hold the catheter with the sponge holding forces close to the tip and introduce into the trunk cavity either blindly or preferably under transabdominal scan guidance. You can inflate the catheter balloon with just one to two mils of fluid or water for injection. Then pull the catheter to ensure that the balloon comes down to the level of the internal os so that the endometrial cavity can be visualized clearly. Then instill the fluid gradually under real time examination. Generally, for saline infusion sonography, not more than three meters actually is required to assess the endometrial cavity. It's good practice to warm the speculum and the fluid. Well, gel can also be used instead of the saline. And so it's have shown that gel is less painful, painful and that the failure rate with gel is lower than the failure rate with saline. But the diagnostic accuracy is similar for both gel and the saline, and that the risk of cancer seeding is less with gel than with saline. But again, some of these gels contain chlorhexidine, which is not suitable for infertile women. Again, when gel is mixed with blood clot, it gives poor visualization. Because of the pressure effect of the fluid, the plot flow may be diminished. These are the items required for saline infusion sonography. Sterile gloves, it's a sterile procedure. Vosalum or tenaculum to call the lip of the cervix. Sponge holding forceps to clean the cervix and the vagina. You need a container, galley pot, or kidney dish for antiseptics, gauze and cotton wool. Uterine sound in case there are challenges, especially in postmodern women, a bivalve speculum. A 2 mil syringe to inflate the balloon, and a 5 mil syringe to introduce fluid into the uterine cavity, size 6 or 8 for lace catheter or neonatal social catheter, the water for injection, and artery forceps. So these are the items I use for solar infusion sonography. It's a sterile surgical glove, gallipot with antiseptic, sterile gauze, sponge holding forceps, a bivalve speculum, a pulsatum, uterine sound, in case one needs to direct the cervix, especially in some postmenopausal women, a pediatric foley catheter, preferably size 6, water for injection. I use water for injection because it comes in 10 minutes and it's cheaper than buying a 500 ml of normal saline when in actual sense one needs only 5 ml of fluid or thereabout. One can use a 5 ml or a 10 ml syringe and a mosquito artery forcep is used to clamp the end of the foley catheter beyond which the needle is inserted and the assistant pushes the fluid into the trunk cavity in real time. Other catheters 
uh, the Goldstein catheter, Tampa catheter, Akras, source Shepard catheter. I've never seen this in my clinical practice. However, neonatal suction catheter is cheaper than for the catheter and it's readily available. But I prefer the pediatric for the catheter because it's self retaining and fluid does not trickle back after installation. This is not the same with neonatal suction catheter where fluid trickles as when you see the fluid, and to me, it's unsuitable for saline infusion. Sonography. Well, patient is positioned in this position, preferably to a position, cleaned, and the catheter is now inserted through the service here into the tray cavity, and this is what you see after insertion. This is just about a meal. But in real time, the fluid can be reduced gradually so that the whole endometrial cavity will be clearly seen. So what do we look for? You are in saline in sonography. You look for endometrial lesions and also the symmetry of the endometrium. So this is a 21 year old with primary amenorrhea. You can see the catheter balloon here. You can see the myometrium here. So if there are any myometrial lesions, we can also pick this. And look at the endometrial cavity. There is no lesion within the endometrium. These are air bubbles during the introduction of the fluid. After the procedure, you can see this air bubble deline clearly delineating the endometrial cavity. Uh, this was a 42 year old being evaluated for premature ovarian insufficiency. Not the normal endometrial cavity here, although there is a myometrial lesion here. Again, this was a 28 year old whose last cell was 8 years and was discovered to have thick endometrium on 2D. Thick endometrium. And again, look at the endometrial lining here. It's not straight. So the endometrial lining is irregular and this slight fluid collection. And this is the rendered image. This same patient, because of a thick endometrium, she had saline infusion, sonography. So look at the asymmetrical endometrial cavity here. Uh, on the rendered image, look at this endometrial faults. This is the 2D saline infusion sonography. Now this is the 3D saline infusion sonography. Again, these are just magnified images, so the same case not the asymmetry of the endometrium here, not also the endometrial faults here on just one side, but look at the 3D saline infusion sonography. And this is the catheter balloon. Now let's look at polyps. Uh, this was a 25 year old who presented with irregular vaginal bleeding. So insulation of saline, not the polyp here with this stock. So this will actually guide the hysteroscopy when he's taking a biopsy or when doing a polypectomy. You can actually measure the length of the stock here and the polyp. After the procedure, look at this air within the endometrial cavity. Uh, let's look at fibroids. Uh, this was a type 3 year old uh, para 1 plus 3 whose last miscarriage was four months prior to presentation. Uh, this is the bladder, this is the cervix. 
not the distal enhancement of the Nabotian follicle. And look at this well circumscribed mass. I couldn't define where the endometrial cavity was. This echogenic lilianae looks more like a, a specific change within the fibroid rather than the endometrium. So when we instill saline, you can see the endometrium clearly delineated and not the transmural uterine fibroid. And again, not these two fibroid nodules that we are not seeing without enhancement. Uh, this was a 36 year old single lady who was pregnant with multiple uterine fibroids. Uh, the size was 36 with gestation and she was 15 weeks pregnant. Here, look at the myometrium here and the submacusal fibroid clearly denotated here because of the amniotic fluid. Look at the fetus here. So, how will one differentiate between endometrial poly and submucous fibroid? The location of endometrial polyp is inside the endometrial cavity, as we can see here. This is the endometrium, and this is the polyp inside the endometrial cavity. For some mucofibroid, it arises from the myometrium. This is the myometrium here. This fibroid arises from the myometrium. Echogenicity of polyp is similar to the endometrium, which is echogenic. This is the endometrium. This is the polyp. So the echogenicity of the polyp is similar to that of the endometrium. So mucous fibroid, the echogenicity is similar to myometrium. This is the myometrium. This is the mucous fibroid. So echogenicity is similar to myometrium. Vascular pedicle, endometrial polyp has a vascular pedicle. This is endometrial polyp. This is vascular pedicle to endometrial polyp. So mucous fibroid usually has peripheral flow. So there is no vascular pedicle fibroids. Lifting of endometrial lining. In the endometrial polyp, there is no lifting. You can see polyp here. So there is no lifting of endometrial lining. In some mucous fibroid, yes, there is lifting, as you can see. This is some mucous fibroid. This is lifting of the endometrial lining. Shadowing of ultrasound beam. There is no shadowing in endometrial polyp. As you can see here, this is the polyp. There is no shadowing. What of in fibroid? There is shadowing. This is fibroid. There is shadowing. So, these are a few ways of differentiating polyp from submucous fibroid. Now, let's look at adhesions. This was a 28 year old with a 15 year history of low abdominal pain and two years history of infertility. This is the catheter balloon. This is the endometrial cavity. Now, not the thickness and the folds of the endometrium here. Not the folds here, not the thickness of the endometrium here. I look at bands of tissue crossing the endometrial cavity. So these are bands of artitions. So in tri -tri artitions. Again, this is a different patient, not the irregular endometrium here. And look at this band of beaded appearance crossing the metrial cavity, and not this bright spot of subendometrial fibrosis. This patient had myomectomy, and uh, she presented later with reduced menstrual flow. It was actually difficult to even distend the endometrial cavity. So look at the endometrial cavity reduced, and look at these bright spots crossing from one end to the other. And this is the HSG. So, iatrogenic, intratrine 
partitions following my method. This is subendometrial fibrosis. You can see the endometrial cavity here, clearly outlined. But this is subendometrial in the basal layer, commonly associated with manual removal or the placenta. Adenomyosis. This was a 49 year old who was postmenopausal. She had TAR and BSO on account of uh, irregular ovariances. And it was found to be chronic torsion and histology reveals adenomyosis, which was not suspected before the surgery. Here you can see the saline infusion. And look at um, this air bubbles. But importantly here, look at the endometrial cavity with the saline. And look at the saline has tracks into the amometrium. So this is endometrial crack. And the fluid trickles through the endometrial tract into the myometrium. So this is a feature of adenomyosis. So saline infusion sonography can also help in the diagnosis of adenomyosis. At times, this air bubbles seen may be seen within the myometrium if there are cracks. And this also suggests adenomyosis. This case we have seen earlier, you know the catheter balloon here, the endometrial distension. When the endometrium distends this way, and patients complains of increasing pain, suspect tubal blockage. Secondly, here you can see the air bubble, another air bubble here. But this air bubble seem to cross the endometrium. This area is a junctional zone. As you trace the junctional zone here, you can see part of this air bubble is within the junctional zone. So this way, one will suspect adenomyosis. Now let's look at natural enhancements. Natural enhancement by blood within the endometrial cavity. This patient came while she was menstruating. So this is a natural enhancement. So you can see the anterior posterior lip of the endometrium, the lateral lip. So you can see clearly that there is nothing in the endometrial cavity. This patient that we've seen earlier on actually presented while she was menstruating. So it is the menstrual blood that delineated clearly the polyp. Here you can see the polyp with its pedicle floor. This patient presented with abnormal uterine bleeding, with failed medical treatment. She had a biopsy which showed inadequate luteal phase. So she was scanned while still bleeding, and you can see the endometrial cavity. And look at this cyst within the myometrium. And if you look at this cyst, you can see some strands within, suggesting that this is recent bleed. So again, here you can see the heterogeneous myometrium, and you can see myometrial buds here. Uh, on this image here, if you follow here, you find out that there is a track from the endometrium here. So this is endometrial crack. So natural enhancement revealing features of adenomyosis. Again, here you can see clearly the endometrial buds. You can see the endometrial cysts and look at the track here. Clearly the track from the endometrium to the myometrium. So diagnosis of Adenomyosis is enhanced with natural enhancement. This patient had 
manner vacuum aspiration twice for the TN placenta. So because of blood collection in the lower uterus, it clearly denylated this retained placental tissue. So natural enhancement help in the diagnosis of retained placenta. It was an eight year old. Look at the size of the uterus in an eight year or nulliparous woman who presented with postmenopausal bleeding. Now, so because of the blood within the endometrial cavity, you can see this multiple tiny polyps. And here, I thought this was actually blood cloth, but on application of color, you can see that it is a live tissue. So natural enhancements and look at the 2D image showing this looping dilatation stenosis all features suggestive of malignancy. This patient presented with heavy menstrual bleeding of two months duration. Look at the endometrial cavity, it's irregular. Look at it, the endometrial cavity is regular. Here again, if you look at the endometrium here, you can see it extends into the mymetrium, not the heterogeneous mymetrium. This again, feature of adenomyosis. This flow here is not a tissue, but is flow from the bleeding. If you do a spectral Doppler here, there will be no pattern at all because it is the flow of blood within the endometrial cavity because of the heavy flow. And on 3D, look at this adenomyotic uterus. This patient left against medical advice, so we do not have a histological diagnosis. She presented postmenopausal bleeding. So here you can see the cervical canal. You can see the normal endometrium here. But look at the mymetrium. Abnormal, irregular. And look at the subcutaneous deposits here. So natural enhancement showed us that this is unlikely to be arising from the endometrium rather maybe arising from the mymetrium this patient presented weeks after delivery with bleeding per vagina and you can see blood clots here within the uterine cavity enhanced because of the bleeding this was a case of cervical cancer with hematometria. So you can see the internal os here, you can see the hematometria, and look at the polyp here. It's not fibroid because it's not arising from the hematometrium here. You can see the echogenicity is more echogenic than the myometrium. So let's look at a few tips and tricks while using saline infusion sonography. So this was the image we shot earlier. You can see after infusion of a uh, water for injection here, you can see the asymmetry and the endometrial folds. And this was while reducing the fluid within the catheter. So this is more of an artifact rather than a lesion. This is a 3D image of the patient who was found to have a thick endometrium in the follicular face with the irregular endometrial cavity and slight fluid collection. So if you look at the rendered image here, this area looks like a small polyp revealed because of this slight collection. But when you do a 3D SIS, you realize that there, there is no polyp. All you have is endometrial folds within the uterine cavity, as can be seen here, and not the catheter ballon. Here in this coronal view, not the clear Johnson zone here. Not the clear junctional zone here, but here you can see that there's obliteration of the junctional zone. Again, here 
obligation of regional zone. And all through here, you can see obligation of regional zone. So if you look at the rendered image here, as you can see the regional zone here clearly, regional zone clearly, but from here you can see the regional zone is interrupted. Again, the case of adenomyosis. Now, this was again when the catheter was withdrawn and there was reduction in the fluid within the catheter pulp. So this should not be mistaken for a lesion, especially when the 3D image is acquired. Here, not the distension of the endometrium and the air bubbles. The area beyond the endometrium here is the gentional zone, though not clearly outlined here. But I'm particular about this air bubble that seem to have crossed the endometrium into the gentional zone. When you have such a feature, please suspect adenomyosis. This was a case of adenomyosis, and this should not be mistaken for Ashama syndrome. These are air bubbles. After a while, this will disappear. This was a case that presented with heavy menstrual bleeding. You can see the blood within the endometrial cavity, and you can see the color uptake. So this color uptake within the endometrial cavity is actually movement of blood within the endometrial cavity, and it's not a lesion. She had SIS and there was no endometrial lesion. If you apply spectral doppler, there will be no particular person here. Now, this was that 34 year old who had uh, polycystic ovary. She had SIS, the catheter busts in the cost of the procedure. But here, not what is around the, cerv the cervix, and you see what looks like. A burn. So this is not cervical ashamas. This is air bubble. So air bubble should not be mistaken for cervical ashamas. Here you can see the steel image. This is air bubble and not cervical ashamas. And you can see the air within the endometrial cavity. If you see similar features within the myometrium then this suggests adenomyosis. So our take a message is that 2D SIS is as good as hysteroscopy in diagnosis of endometrial lesions, but 3D SIS is actually more sensitive than 2D. In the future, 3D SIS with sonobiopsy may replace hysteroscopy and biopsy as first-line cleaning modality for endometrial lesions. Thank you very much.